Hello, everyone. So welcome back for another career and spirituality conversation. So I'm your host, Julie Pone. I support spiritual seekers having a career experience into enjoying their professional and, and spiritual journey. And today I have the pleasure to share the space with James, James Moffat. Hi, James, how are you today? Hi, Julie. Yeah, I'm great. Just back from my holiday. So yeah. I don't know if I'm fresh and ready to go, but I'm ready. <laughs> awesome. So James, James, um, in one word, James is a storyteller and, and he's had, had a, a a very interesting career trajectory to get there. So I'm going to let him talk to us about it. And But actually, James has offered to lead us into our, our grounding before we start the conversation. So I'm going to leave the mic to you, James, to start us with a one minute, two minutes grounding before we start our, our journey together. Right. In which particular way would you like that? Uh, deep breathing or any way that you enjoy that that you like to do that for your, when you're doing your own practice. Yeah, typically, yeah, I take deep breaths. Yeah. And then relax and try to empty my mind of everything that's going on around me. Okay. And and then focus on myself, my inner self, because that's where the answers are gonna come from. And ignore the surroundings because there can be an influence, both good and bad, yeah. but you want to really feel within yourself and the, the depth of who you are and reconnect with that because that is the connection to source. So shall we do a minute, a minute mm. of of this? Mm, yeah, I, I will let you take the lead actually okay. in this. Okay, awesome. So with with I want I want us to keep your words in mind, then before doing this uh, minute of breathing. So let's close our eyes. And for a moment, just pressing our feet on the floor to feel the support from the earth. And then bring our attention back into, into our chest, into our heart. And imagining as if our breath is flowing in and out through our heart. And breathing a little bit deeper and slower than we usually do. And on each of our in-breath, following our breath inside of ourselves, connecting with ourselves, with the silence within ourselves, giving us the space to listen for a moment. As James wisely said, that's where the answers come from. Wonderful couple of breaths of inner silence. Before starting our conversation. So whenever everyone feels ready, we can open our eyes again. And welcome back. <laughs> Hello again. Hello. Oh, hello, thank you. 
Uh, thank you for your words, James. Sometimes I'm leading this uh, grounding with a, with a sense of um, openness towards the outside. And it's nice sometimes to change the perspective and bring it back, uh, you know, in a different way and reminding ourselves that of our connection and, and know, knowing to be comfortable with the silence within ourselves so and that connection. So thank you. And um, so that gave, gave us a little, already a little insight into your, you know, your practice. So that's actually going to be my, my first question for you is what's your relationship to spirituality, your connection to spirituality. And after that, we'll link that with your career trajectory. So feel free to intermix the two if that's, you know, if it comes about, but um, I'm curious about your spiritual journey first. Uh, I, I think during your life, you have different awakening times. And a lot of the time the signs are there, but you don't actually see them or you don't recognize them. And as a child growing up, I felt that there's definitely a connection somewhere with something and I didn't know what it was. And I'd had a, a mixed background with different religions within the family yeah. and from parents and being subjected to churches, to synagogues, to, to having girlfriends that uh, were very deep into religion, either born again Christians and so on. And so... I, I was very open-minded and I went along to churches. I went to synagogues. I, I listened to the religious education at school, but I was a critical thinker and a questioner. I questioned everything. And I think even as a child, I wanted to know the answers that nobody could give me. And I thought, how can there be so many religions and so many people believing in so many different things? Surely looking around, aren't we all the same? And, and, so searching for answers that people just dismissed, uh, you're just young, you're just adolescent, you're, you're just learning uh, and stop all these questions, just kind of get on with, with life and yeah, stop philosophizing kind of thing. And I, I found in the teenage or, or later years, like when you're at parties with friends and and maybe you have one drink too many, and you're lying on the grass in the back garden, gazing up at the stars in a group, and, and then you start philosophizing again. Then you start asking the same questions and other people ask the same. And then the next day you either got a hangover and, and you just get on with life and forget about it. Yeah. But so that feeling has always been there really from childhood. But more recently now, the, in, in the last few years, it has become more obvious and evident within myself because I, I've had dreams very vivid dreams and enlightening dreams with messages within them as well and when i've asked questions then the answers have come within dreams and but i've asked for that i've asked for signs and and, and ways that i can be informed and i was always kind of a dreamer or a daydreamer at school and yeah i i just find that there's a magical consciousness that happens or subconsciousness that happens when you're dreaming and very unknown kind of reality that we uh, venture into when we're sleeping that uh, we don't really understand. And which is quite funny because I, I, I had a whole discussion on this on my show yeah. and we had a panel discussion on dreams, but I mean, that that's an, another thing, but so I, I think spirituality it's just an answer to your question has always been there from a childhood, but more uh, relevant now in the last few years than ever before. Yeah. So it sounds like you're, well, like a lot of us, like you were asking yourselves a lot of questions and at some stage realized that with the intention of having answers, somehow the answers are coming. Yeah. I would say that I can get most answers to everything now because I went beyond that. I went into shamanic healing as well and shamanic crystal work with a crystal pendant. And I learned how to do that. And, and that's another story within itself. 
how I picked my crystal mm -hmm. and oh should I say my crystal picked me yeah uh, I've often heard that that yeah the crystal chooses the uh the practitioner rather than the opposite yeah so uh, with within that so within kind of shamanic work and also uh more inner kind of soul work then i i can find a lot of the answers and i don't think anybody knows all the answers to to everything but at least you can connect with something that that reassures you that we're on the right path yeah and so for you when when you are in a stage where you're seeking for guidance what are you relying on mostly to find the path is it yeah. your crystal work or is it something in your body what are the signs that maybe some people might you know relate to yeah i think crystal work is is an aid is a tool basically the, the answers we already have with inside is how to tap into those okay. and people do it in different ways i find that using a crystal is just a reassurance that if i felt that something was not right i mean using kind of your gut feeling then uh and, and common sense then then my crystal just confirmed the, the feeling I already had but in in saying that if there's a specific question I needed to ask then yeah I, I could have confirmation by using the crystal mm. because the crystal can never lie yeah. and you, you get you get the answers I mean it might not be the answer you want to hear but you get the answer yeah yeah and and then additionally to that yeah if there's something really bugging me and I wanted to know, then typically it'd be manifested into a dream. And sometimes I could prompt the dream and other times it, it just happened because uh, it was that state of mind that I was in. And yeah, I'd have it as a vivid dream, but repetitive dream all night long because I was terrible in the morning. I'd completely forget forgotten i even had a dream so something had to be so repetitive within that oh, okay. sleeping period otherwise i would forget and the, the messages were so strong that it wasn't for me to forget mm, yeah that's interesting the, the the topic of dreams as just is coming back now just a second time like you know the um uh my previous guest guest alex was talking about dreams in the context of, context of carl jung and how dreams can be analyzed but how after we had dream then sometimes we might see things or animals or things outside in our environment that somehow relate to the dream and then so it's a way for life to tell us some things and we can follow signs that way and have like you said, confirmations or or it prompts or, or reflection about ourselves. Yeah. So I would say over the last few years, I, I've had some very meaningful dreams and I can remember them and the messages that were within the dreams. But also I had signs that the next day I saw everything that I dreamt about, basically. Wow. And... Yeah, which is a, a beautiful moment actually when that actually happens because it is a confirmation that you're connecting mm -hmm. with the right entities and, and and source. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the universe has feedback, so like we are inputting something, and then and then we are seeing things outside of ourselves that either confirms or gives us some answers or yes i i love ha i love having um testimonies of this constant feedback loop that we ha we have between us and and the universe on the outside the outside world um so yeah that's that's interesting and so i also wanted to 
get back to talking about your career journey because now we know that you have a strong you know you've been working with crystals and and uh, you're having that strong spiritual connection but where do you come from professionally and how did you end up doing what you're doing now basically yeah great question yeah as a kid growing up i had no idea what i wanted to do but i knew I was practically minded and a logical thinker, and I, I liked hands-on things. Now, there was never really any guidance from school, and I mean, sometimes you get from your parents, but they, they just look at, well, what would be a, a reasonable job to earn some money, rather than that something that's really you. So at that time, yeah, I was mechanically minded, so... I did mechanical engineering and then I, I moved into electrical engineering and telecommunications. And then that, my background was really field engineer working for a big telco company in the UK. And then I saw after many years of being in the field and then in the office and then looking after teams of engineers, then I moved into sales and then from sales into marketing and then, and then basically left the UK and followed a yeah which is a difficult thing at the time but I felt that was part of my journey as well and I went to live in the Netherlands and I worked for a software company and then had international travel and basically selling uh, telecommunications equipment for the big telcos and that got me yeah in, into a different kind of era in my life in the way that uh i felt that there was a focus there but i i still even though i was young and i experienced endless travel like weekly plane journeys around the world uh after 20 years of that and many many different companies and in senior roles i decided it, it well it wasn't really for me i was already feeling that i wanted to do something different and I was fed up with the travel. It, it, I, when you're young and single, it's great. But when I got married and got three small kids, and it was the birth of my twins, right? so this is seven years ago, that I couldn't travel anymore. I didn't want to travel anymore. And there's a lot of pressure on if you're heading up sales and marketing, then you have to be out in the field and you have to support. And I didn't want that anymore, but I didn't know what I wanted. So basically I had the ultimatum of, am I a houseman or am I a salesman? And obviously the houseman. So uh, my priorities were with the family. So that's when my career kind of came to an end and I was completely lost, disillusioned, fed up, frustrated. And at an age that, what, what am I going to do? And I, I find that there's three fundamental questions that you ask in your life. One, as a child, what will I be when I grow up? And I had no idea. I mean, apart from saying like spaceman or whatever. Uh, then when you're in your kind of midlife, you ask again, what's it all about? Which I wrote a great blog about. I wrote, what's it all about? And in brackets, Alfie. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie with Michael Caine. Oh, yeah, it's great. Anyway, so what is life all about? I had no idea. I had no direction, and I didn't know what I wanted. And I felt unemployed with three kids and really lost, completely lost. And then there's another time that you ask, if you haven't found what it is that you're looking for, is when you retire, you ask, what's next? And I don't want to spend a whole life searching for something. And I find that most people never really know who they are. I actually, statistically, 99% of the population never know who they are. And yeah, there's a difference between existing and living. And if you're lucky, you can exist. But most people are not really living. They're not living their purpose meaningful life of the passions and the desires that they want so yeah what i do now is i mean i haven't found myself 
I, I then help others to find themselves. I also, on the business side, because I have a business background, uh, I help entrepreneurs, startups grow their business through sales and marketing techniques. And within that, within finding myself, I also find that particularly with children, I find storytelling, particularly bedtime storytelling, was something uh, of immense value and it helps solve loads of problems. So also with my daughter and her fear, completely got rid of her fear through bedtime stories. So storytelling is basically the umbrella of everything I do. Mm-hmm. So, and so I have a program called School Kit for Life and I, I can do it in groups for school kids so I can do it individually. And it's all about uh, the power of stories to to solve emotional challenges. Yeah. So so now you've arrived at a stage where storytelling is mostly your main uh, way of uh, of communication and your your how you're working with people, whether it's children or in companies uh, supporting entrepreneurs. Is is that, yeah, is that yes. right? Okay. Storytelling is basically the umbrella of everything. If you, if you think about, I think we completely underestimate their value. Yeah. I mean, from the moment that we wake up in the morning to the time we go to bed, and even when in our dreams, it's stories. Stories make you feel good. Well, it can also make you feel bad, depending on the story. But I mean, in general, we are all storytellers. We all tell and share stories. And if you can understand the value and and how to articulate that value proposition through stories, I mean, then it's just magical. Mm. And I would love to backtrack a little bit because on your way to becoming a storyteller, there was that that place where, you know, finding yourself. Mm -hmm. And so how did you find yourself? Yeah, so as I said, I, I was made unemployed. So I, yeah, with unemployment, they yeah, try to help you find a job. So they send you to different coaches for one thing or another. And I had an appointment to, to see a coach um, to speak English because she was originally from the UK. Mm-hmm. So helped me because wow. living in Switzerland, I mean, in the German speaking part, mm-hmm. uh, it wasn't so easy, right? Uh, and and particularly to express yourself. I mean, English is far better for me. So I went to this coach and I, with my CV in my hand, and I was thinking, right, we're going to do some looking at the CV and how I can improve it. Anyway, she said, she only asked me a few fundamental questions, but she was a business coach, but also a life coach. And she she practiced something called Ikigai, which I had ne- never heard of before. So, so she said to me, uh, I don't see any problem with your CV. What's the problem? And I said, well, I, I'm not actually interested in the jobs that I'm applying for. And she said, the problem is, what I believe is you don't know who you are. And I thought, what sort of question is that? So I said, of course I do. She said, well, who are you? And I said, well, I'm James. And she said, I, I didn't ask that. She said, I know you, James. I've I've got a form that says James is coming here to see me today, right? I know. She said, who are you? And I couldn't answer the question. So every time she asked, who are you? I said, the the father of three children. And she said, no, I never asked your personal situation. I asked, who are you? Who is James? So I couldn't answer. Every time I tried, uh, she said, no, 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 no. And she said, to, to spare your embarrassment, she said, you're not alone. 99% of the population don't know either if you ask them the same question. So they'll always reply back their name. And I never asked what their name was. I asked who they are. So with that in mind, she said that we can do a program and it'll be focused on understanding who you are. And based on the philosophy of Ikigai, uh, which is a Japanese way of life. Uh, Iki meaning life and Gai meaning purpose. Mm-hmm. So we did that. And then out of that, uh, derived uh, more details about who I am, the things I love, the things I'm good at, what I could offer the world. And storytelling 
absolutely fundamentally came out as the the key attribute of who I am and and what I'm here for and when you when when you recognize that for yourself about the storytelling what was your reaction did did it come across as something like a real discovery or was it uh oh yeah of course did could you see how maybe in your childhood or in your life that was always there but you couldn't see it what how was it yeah i i it's always been there and the the beauty of ikigai is when you first go there and it's all about questions asking the right questions because you have the answers within you just don't know because nobody's asked you the right question so i had no idea i had no idea who i was and which direction i was going in or what i wanted out of life i knew the things i liked uh but yeah th these always kind of seem to be philosophical kind of questions when people say what do you like I mean, it, and you want the practicality but it's, well what am i going to do about it right and people can quickly jump at you well what are you going to do with your life well, I, i don't know right so so when she asked the questions she asked focusing on all the things i love so storytelling came out of that and the things that i believe i'm good at and storytelling But then the kind of the killer question was, think back to when you were a child. Don't rush the answer. Did you tell stories when you were a child? And I had to think kind of long and hard about it because I, I couldn't remember. And then kind of that light bulb moment and that aha, like, yes. When I used to walk to school, my buddies used to come around and pick me up at home and we we walk less 20 minutes to school and we were between the age of nine and 11 at the time. And I would always like be the, not just the kind of the, the, the joker and stuff and, and the guy that's trying to entertain the others. But I was, I used to tell stories. I don't know why, I don't even know how I started, but I remember telling stories, typically fantasy stories. And My friends wanted to listen. So in that 20 minute walk to school, I just make up stories and and have them captivated for the whole journey. And I used to deliver newspapers as a newspaper boy. And my friends used to come with me, not to help me deliver the papers, but to ask for stories. And then I'll tell them stories. And but honestly, I couldn't remember that. I, I'd spent a lifetime, right, 40 years of forgetting all of this until that kind of magical moment when the ikigai coach asked me think back when you're a child and and that's really the turning point that was when i thought i mean she even said that the making of who you are is up to the age of seven you know who you are you know your purpose you know why you've come here because it's already there anything after that is an indoctrination and a brainwashing and everything to kind of forget who you are. And it was kind of that kind of recalling that moment of, of remembrance really of storytelling and how I enjoyed it, how it brought pleasure to others. And, and then, yeah, even as a salesperson, when I was selling products and things, I was never selling the features and functionality I was wrapping it up into a story, right? Kind of typically the the problem, the solution, the results. I mean, the start, the middle, and then the end. And people would remember the story. They wouldn't always remember their features and functionality, but they would remember the story. But then there's the art to telling the story as well. So, so that's kind of how it all began or how I remembered, because it was something that was always there. It's just once you start remembering and then you're seeing the value of it and then how to articulate that and how to put the pieces together, then there's something so magical that every day you can use it for everything. Yeah. So already, like I, I've, I've heard you say that there are two main 
areas that you're using storytelling to help people. Like one is more of the businessy entrepreneurial world and the other one with the children. So can you talk to us about both? Yes. So in, in the business world, the, I mean, I also had a mentor as well. And I learned particularly with startups, how many startups fail and why are they failing? And also how do they pitch when it comes to for investment? Okay. So I, I was trained on basically perfecting your pitch uh, by an industry veteran from the Shark Tank, a guy called Kevin Harrington, right? And don't ask me how much it cost me for that mentoring, but uh, anyway, a great guy and taught me a lot. And that also introduced me to creating my own radio show. Yeah. But we'll come on to that in a minute. So uh, he said that, that for pitching, when a startup pitches, then you need the ingredients for that. I mean, his three parts or parts of the ingredients that so you said they need to tease the audience, please the audience and seize the audience. Mm. And I didn't like that. I mean, I loved it at the beginning because it taught me a lot. Uh, but then once I started thinking about it, and particularly when you have children, you don't like the word tease. You're always telling them stop teasing. So I thought, I don't want to tease people. I, I want to connect with people. Right. And then so that it was tease and please. And I want to, yeah, please them, but it's all about communication. So I want to communicate something of immense value. Mm -hmm. And then I want to convert them to my desired outcome. So I called it my three C's. Yeah. So connect, communicate, convert to a desired outcome. And it if you use these three for everything, mm -hmm. it, it works. Because it, it made me think that a comedian, if a comedian wants to have a, an audience to tell jokes, then the, the comedian needs to, first of all, connect with the right audience that like that type of joke, then communicate something, which is the story or, or the joke. And then he needs to convert to a desired outcome, which is to make them laugh, right? So he needs to take them on that journey and then get the desired outcome in mind, which is the laughing. So and so he's converted, converted them into laughing. So it works in absolutely everything. So if you think about a startup pitching, he needs to connect to the audience, which could be the investor, right? Uh, communicate something of immense value that has the investor like on the edge of his chair that wants to invest, and then convert to the outcome you have in mind is the investor to invest. So it applies to absolutely everything. So then I created my own program on that. So that was for the business world. So in the storytelling. Do you want to tell us about your program for that? Yeah, so basically I, I do a program both for the business world, which is all about, I mean, that, that's just one small part of it. I have my... <laughs> Yeah, I, I use ac acronyms a lot. So I have my three A's as well. Yeah. So I before I can help with any business, I have to A, first A, assess. Uh -huh. I mean, it's like the doctor-patient analogy. You yeah. go to the doctor, the doctor can't help you unless he has asked questions. So he's kind of assessing. Yeah. So the first one's assess and then uh, adjust. So adjust what's working, what's not working. Right. And then you can accelerate. So accelerate the business forward because you've made the adjustments. So but within that are the three C's as well, because if you want to articulate your value proposition through stories, then you need to understand your desired outcome and how to obtain it. So but that is the same principles for everything. It is common sense, basically. Yeah, and I'm, talking, I'm even thinking about people for uh job interviews like uh yeah like the the a way to talk about to talk about ourselves that will you know uh, make us stand out yeah so everything is about looking at the desired outcome what do i want to achieve and working back from that so if it's a job interview 
I, I want to at least get through to the next round, right? So how am I going to do that? So I need to then piece it up into chunks, right? So how do I start? How do I introduce myself? Or if I'm asked to, to tell a story or introduce me or, or my track record or history or education or employment or whatever, how do I start And without being boring? And then what's the middle bit to keep them engaged that they want to hear more, but also without rambling on too much that they want you to shut up? So, and then get your desired outcome in mind is get to a point that you're leaving them on, like you've hooked them. They want to know more. So don't give away too much either. You want them to ask questions. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and so that's for the like professional storytelling and now for the, uh, storytelling with children, which I think you're very passionate about. Yes. Uh, when my eldest son, he's 10 now, when he was younger and he, he could uh, have bedtime stories, so I don't know, four or five at the time, and I would read bedtime stories with him, uh, typically Mr. Men books, right? Uh, you, what? Mr. Men. You know the Mr. Men books? Mr. Men? No, I don't know. All right, you got like Mr. Strong, Mr. Small, Mr. Tall, Mr. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Whatever. I used to pick them up at the airports when I traveled, and they were great for bedtime stories. But I would change the words and just use the images for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, I didn't like the stories always on how they they read. And... When it's dark at night and you've got the lights low, I couldn't read the text. So right, I, I had to make it up anyway. So but the making them up was more fun because it was your story then. But anyway, one day my eldest son, Tom, said to me, Daddy, uh, I would like stories about my adventures. And because he was fed up with the Mr. Men books, and although we did try other books as well, he said, and I said, well, what kind of adventures do you want? And he said, what about going to the moon? So, so anyway, long story short, uh, I thought, well, there's three components to the story. There's the start, middle and end. So let's try and put a theme to it as well. So he has a fluffy rabbit called Doodoo, right? And so I thought, what about, because I love the word marvelous, Right. Every, every, every time I traveled and people said, how are you? I would say marvelous. And particularly in the Netherlands, marvelous became a word that everybody used in the workplace because that I would always say marvelous and then they would repeat that back. And but so we called it the marvelous adventures of Tom and Dudu. And the, the, the first very first story was going to the moon. So I thought, how can we put it in a way that is educational, entertaining? And not too long, because it has to be a short bedtime story. And it actually gets the desired outcome I have in mind, which is him to go to sleep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Not forgetting the, the yeah. ultimate goal. Yeah. So we had to kind of wrap all of this up into like 10, 15 minute stories. And then, then we thought, I thought at the time for memorabilia, why don't I audio record them as well? So you can get these audio recorders for your phone. So I, so I downloaded the app and I recorded it. So we have, now we have hundreds, hundreds of audio recordings, right? And it, it's beautiful when you listen back and he hears them of him when he was like four or five years old in a story, because I then made storytelling for children interactive. And people say, well, what's interactive storytelling? I said, well, it's bi-directional and it's having the other person interact. Otherwise, I mean, I, I, I use kind of an example. Like when I was in my early days of sales, I wasn't telling stories. I was boring the pants off people, trying to get them to buy something, right? Which I'd learned that boring skill from this the senior sales guy, Right. And now I'm copying him. Right. And people think, oh, when's this guy going to shut up? 
and looking at their watches think oh it's coffee break time now so i thought if you make it interactive like everything interactive storytelling's got to be interactive then you keep their audience engaged and if you, you just think back to the comedian the comedian doesn't like just ramble on until he gets to the punchline that they're normally interacting with the audience so if we can interact with our audience of whoever it is, then we know that they're still engaged, right? So there's an art to that. You can have the silent pauses, you can add NLP into that if you understand them. Even the fundamentals of NLP, yeah. then by open questions, closed questions and so on. So then kind of blending what I'd learned about sales and entrepreneurialism into bedtime stories, and then seeing how that worked and then what would be the outcome of that and could i then in the end it, it was actually reverse engineering what i learned from the doing the bedtime stories with the kids i then used in the business world right and so i took parts from the business to kind of the bedroom and then from the bedroom back into the business from the and bedroom to the boardroom <laughs> <laughs> yeah from bedroom to boardroom actually that could be a program couldn't it yeah well it depends which be bedroom though we got to be careful with that yeah i guess all this political <laughs> correctness you got to be careful what you say so anyway we started uh the marvelous adventures of tom and doodoo going to the moon so we wanted to start it like every day it starts the same so it would start off I was taught about the hook. You need the hook to get people going, the headline, right? So you've got to think to yourself that like you're the editor-in-chief of a newspaper and what sells a newspaper is the headline and the story. Mm -hmm. But you have to have both. So how do you hook them is with the headline, right? So the marvelous adventures of Tom Dudu going to the moon. So we start off like ding-a-ling-a-ling, ding-a-ling-a-ling. The alarm went off. It was seven o'clock in the morning. And... Tom said to Dudu, come on, Dudu, it's time to get up. And Dudu said, why, what we're doing? And Tom said, we're going to the moon. And Dudu said, but how, how are we going to get there? And Tom said, we're going to build a rocket. And then anyway, so it starts off like that in the morning. And then they go down, have their breakfast, they get dressed, they brush their teeth. So there's a routine there. Okay. And then, so that's the, the front bit. Then the middle bit is they're building the rocket and going to the moon. And then the last bit is to come back home and they share their story with their family then they get the pajamas on brush the teeth and go to bed yeah they're tired from from a journey to the moon right yeah so we created our first book which is here wow oh it's awesome right and and in there it's got all the illustrations of going to the moon tom and doo doo yeah all right, Tom and Dudu going to the moves. I don't have the best camera today on my Zoom. And, and then in the end, I mean, yeah. then they're going to bed. Yeah. Right. So, so that, 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 that was the first book we did uh, quite a number of years ago now. And then when we had the twins, uh, a boy and a girl, then I, I did it, took it to a whole new level because I did the twins together. So when you have two kids interacting, we create the most magical stories. And as I said, we audio record most of them yeah. because if I can't tell them a story because I'm busy, then they listen to the recording of a previous one and they you can hear them laughing in bed right but i always believe that if a child goes to bed with a smile on their face and something memorable and fun then they don't have nightmares or bad dreams or they're, they're relaxed they want to go to bed and and the desired outcome as i said that i had in mind is to get them to go to sleep right so in the end they even because it's interactive i'm asking them like in the story, like to, to talk and, and share so I can steer it. So they're interacting. So the story is as much theirs as it is mine. And I'm more the guide and it's their story. And 
yeah, it is, it's beautiful. So, so I, I do that with kids, with parents, also teach parents the art of interactive bedtime storytelling. And I tell you, it transforms kids and, and their parents. The, the, the bond now that you have with your kids is absolutely inseparable through the power of stories. And you were and, telling me that there is like nearly also a therapeutic aspect that, you know, you had an experience of helping your daughter. with. Oh, yes. As well. so, so my daughter, when she was around five, she had a, a fear of everything. She wouldn't go outside the house. Uh, it was a challenge to get her to, to make friends and do anything. Uh, she wouldn't do any sports or activities. And she's basically a recluse and introvert. And so I thought, Let, let's try something out. Let's just try storytelling. But rather than looking at her with the, the problem, we'll introduce the, the they used to have lots of stories going to the farm mm -hmm. and they loved the farm because they they got to know all the animals and then we thought well let's name the animals so they had names for the animals so so at, at the farm the ringleader was charlie charlie the donkey and he was a special character but he became my daughter abby's best friend right and if they went on other adventures, then she'd want Charlie to come with her, right? And Sam, her twin brother, he would pick Gorilla because he likes monkeys and things. So he'd pick Gorilla. And, and they knew the animals, the difference between the animals at the farm and at the zoo and stuff, way before the other kids uh, at the kindergarten here. Well, at the Kita, which is like the nursery school, uh, because we we educate them through stories and then they'll correct each other if the animal they say which ones were at the farm and then they would correct and say no no a gorilla's not the farms at the zoo and it was so funny but anyway to the point so i i thought let's just try something so i said to sam and abby i said right the next adventure we're going on a roller coaster ride and you're allowed to take a friend with you so Sam quickly says, I'm taking Gorilla, right? And I'm going to sit on the back seat. So I thought that's sorted. And I said, Abby, who do you want to take? And she said, Charlie, right? And I thought, well, let's play on this. So I said, Charlie doesn't really want to go, does he? He's scared. And she said, no, he's scared. And then I fed her kind of the fear that Charlie would have. And then I said that, uh, Charlie would like to go on the, the, the front seat, the front row. Will you go on the front seat with Charlie? And he said, yeah. And I said, can you tell Charlie that everything will be okay? It's just a short ride. So she said, Charlie, everything's going to be okay. It's a short ride. And then I said, tell him that. Uh, you can hear the kids in the background here. right? Uh, I said, tell him that. It'll, it'll be over shortly and uh, you'll hold his hand. So she said, Charlie, I'm going to hold your hand. And so she reassured Charlie all the way through before it started. And then we started the adventure of the roller coaster ride. And, and then it was climbing up the steep bit and it was getting to the top, ready to come down. And then we're describing how it's going to be and everything. And I was saying, tell Charlie it's going to be okay. You're holding his hand. And, and anyway, after the roller coaster ride, she was completely cured. Yeah. She had no fear. And she's an extrovert now. And she is the most fearless girl ever. Wow. I mean, we've just come back from holiday and she she does horse riding. She does uh, rock climbing. She does, I mean, great swimmer. She everything. Whereas the other two are fear of some things that they don't do. And she does it all. And she says, Daddy, why don't you tell Sam about the story? And maybe you can get, he can overcome his fear. She said, because it worked for me, right? She even uh, has that, that distance that she understands that, that it got her over her own. Yeah, she, she knows the power of the story. And she wow. knows, yeah. she keeps telling me, you've got to tell Sam the story and he'll not have the fear of something, whatever. Oh, and 
And it was so magical because she is completely transformed. And that's all through the power of stories. So that is something that you can do for all sorts of emotions and challenges. But if you do it in a friendly sort of easygoing way, I mean, I, I did at some schools and we started off, what is storytelling? And then what are the components of a story? And then who tells a story? How would you tell a story? So we didn't touch on anything that was going to cause them any problems. And then asking, everything is about asking questions. What's the story? Yeah. Right? And then they tell you. Actually, they have the answers. All you're doing, like like as in the Ikigai coach, is asking the right questions. So you're asking the questions so that they come up with their story. Well, they come up with the answers as well, because in the classroom, I mean, I, I did it with kids of the age of, in an international school with kids between the age of 10 and 14. Of, there were 72 different nationalities at the school. So, and in a mixed group, I just got everyone to sit in a circle and I just asked them, like, who has, who tells stories? And only like three put the hand up out of 24. And I said, actually, you all tell stories. I said, in, in, in the break time, when you're talking to each other, you, you're sharing stories. What did I see on TV and, and what happened last night? And you talk about your family. When you meet someone for the first time, you're asking them questions and it's a story. So once they understand that, then they open up and they're excited about wanting to contribute. And then, then you ask them for the answers. Like, like, I mean, you could take it to the next level. You could address fear. What is fear? I, I could say what my fear is, but it doesn't mean we all have the same fear. So then when you ask them and say, what is fear? And then get them to answer. Then once one starts answering, others want to join in. And they said, who has that fear? Has anyone got a fear of heights? And then you explain that, <laughs> right? Yeah. I, actually, I thought I had a fear of heights, but it was actually a fear of falling. Oh, interesting. There was a difference because I'm okay in an aeroplane because yeah. I feel relatively safe. But if I'm on a, a, a swing bridge or, or, or on a rope bridge crossing between two mountains or something, yeah, Different I wouldn't story. be particularly yeah. feel safe. So it was the fear of falling. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, to talk to, to you about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, so, yeah. So, so have you, you know, you, you've developed something, a program or something specific for, for schools or for children? Yes. So I have a program called School Kit for Life. Okay. And it, it's all about storytelling and, but also identifying either trapped emotions, emotional challenges, and even if you just want to learn the art of storytelling, because everybody tells stories, but some are good at telling stories and some less so. So once you understand how you tell a story, then you can articulate the value of that story in a far better way. I mean, and then it can be used for everything. It could be used, like as we mentioned earlier, job interviews, pitching a product, getting investment, whatever just communication even day-to-day -day communication with our loved ones i mean it, exactly that also like when you're falling out with a partner mm -hmm. what's the desired outcome you want to have in mind to kind of rectify the situation so a story um i actually funny you should say that my wife wanted to go away for a weekend with her old colleagues that she used to share with when she was a student an apartment so if she just come to me and said like you're gonna i'm gonna wait for the weekend you're looking after the three kids i'd say okay no bloody wait right but she she did it without even thinking yeah. but so we do it naturally but if we understand how we do it yeah. then it, we can get the value across much better so she she had to connect so using my three C, she had to connect with the right person, me. She's not going to tell the neighbor. 
right? So she had to connect with me. Then she had to communicate something of immense value that, and then drag it out, show me right, the emotional side as well. Right. Oh, yeah. Remember the, the, the girls I used to share apartment with all those years ago and the, the wonderful times and memories. And and then like and then make me feel guilty that, oh, yeah, she needs to see them. And then so that's the communication bit. And then the convert is to her desired outcome, which was me to say, oh, yes. Yeah, I'm happy to look after the kids and go, which she did. And I and then as a bonus, I was saying, then how much money do you want for going? <laughs> Right. So there is a way that you can do things. Yeah. Uh, if you think about it, you know, it, it's all common sense and logic. I mean, there's no secrets to it. It's just about put it in a way that you'd naturally do. Just think about doing it before you actually open your mouth. Yeah. So, James, because we, we are nearly, you know, we're coming towards the end of our a session uh is there one question that i haven't asked you that you would love to answer yeah so with the storytelling i i i mentioned like with kevin harrington as my mentor he suggested the radio yeah. right because i was looking at the other entrepreneurs and i was thinking we're all struggling to grow our respective businesses and and the biggest challenge that we face is visibility and then once we've got visibility is then how to make an impact with it. So I thought, well, everybody's using visibility and impact, right? So I looked up visibilityimpact.com and it didn't exist. So I thought, how can it not exist? Right? So I registered it. Right? And then I thought, well, how can I help others create that visibility? So I speak with Kevin Harrington. He said, why not the radio? I thought the radio how can I do something with the radio? I don't know anything about the radio. So anyway, in Switzerland, there is uh, World Radio Switzerland, WRS, out of Geneva, and it's in English. So I contacted the, the director and I said, I wanted to run a program that would be kind of a podcast uh, and to showcase a different business each week. So anyway, long story short, we did that for six months, although it cost me a fortune, right? Because it's a commercial radio and you could only have five minutes airtime, although that five minutes was put out five times a week at different times. I mean, it was good and it worked, but it wasn't personal. And I wanted something that you, you could talk to people and, and there wasn't really a time limit per se. And so after six months of doing that, then I created my own podcast and I called it Featured Business because it's about featuring a business. So I've now been doing that for three years or so. And yeah, I've had 134 guests uh, is once a week, typically every Friday. And the more diverse guests, the better. And normally kind of the airtime like this it it's an hour and a half so it's like an hour of the recording but there's some preamble and some chit chat before we get going and it can have an audience if if the guest wants an audience if not it's recorded and put on youtube and the audio is on spotify and everyone's welcome to be a guest I uh, just have to contact me. And I, actually, Julia, I'd love you to be a guest because I want to hear your story. Oh, yeah. Well, I'd love to be a guest. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's a yes. <laughs> it's a yes from me. Yeah, excellent. It sounds like the Eurovision. Right? <laughs> oh, no, that's an X factor, wasn't it? It was a yes oh, from me. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It's a yes from me, <laughs> for sure. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, James. Yeah, I appreciate the invitation. But Anyway, you're opening this is an open invitation for anyone who has like who would want to, you know, to to contact you to be on the show. Someone who has just an yeah. interesting story or business to promote or what's. Yeah, what typic typically it started off with kind of business owners and startups. So young startups typically 
there were in Switzerland because I'm based here. So out of the universities that they created a startup. So it just formed as a team. So there'd be one person, typically the, the founder, mm -hmm. uh, that would come on and talk about either sustainability or, or their product or services or, or whatever it was. And then also business owners that wanted more visibility. Uh, but then I owned it up to anyone in the world. So I've had guests from all over the world talking about all sorts of different things, actually the most diverse things that you can imagine. But I don't mind. I'm very open-minded and I'm interested in stories. So I take people on a journey, basically, from their childhood to where they are now. And I find that is the bit that's usually missing because when someone talks about their business, it's about their products or services. But I want to know how did they get there? What was their story? What was their childhood like? Was there any turning points in their life within the corporate world and decided that's not for them? Or did they never go to the corporate world or whatever? But that comes out. That is the magic of this because you really touch on emotions and you touch on turning points. And I mean, some, maybe even some tragic heartbreaking stories, but people also have a desire to, to want to share these stories. And it is typically not what you would ask in, in the business world. You ask about their products and services, but when you understand the person more, you feel that bond and that connection with them and it's just beautiful so we do that so it's basically every open to anybody and not corporate companies that's not really the audience unless it's a key public speaker that could be used as an as a an inspiration for others but typically the sole proprietor business owners or or startups or people have just got interesting stories. So also, I mean, as an example, I've had people talk about that the healing properties of microdosing with mushrooms. That, that, that was very, we do it for three fundamental reasons. It's, it's to inspire others, to educate, because some of these things are so educational, right? And then the most important is to bring hope because we're living in a world of scaremongering and fear and people are, are giving up, are actually giving up mentally and becoming suicidal. And if we can inspire people and, and bring them hope, then th this is the purpose. Gotcha. And this is why we do it. And yeah, so as I said, people are welcome to be a guest and I, I can share all the the links and everything i will make sure that everything is available and people just need you know uh, anywhere like just clicking and with your contacts so they can get in touch mm -hmm. to talk about getting on your show yes yeah absolutely and anything else that you want people to know about yeah i just think that when we talk about spirituality and and life and What's it all about? And it's a challenge to actually know. And we're always digging deep within ourselves to or searching externally. And there is a book I'm currently writing, or, although I'm a, where 10, 12, I think it is, 12 of the previous guests uh, are going to be in our first edition book. All of our stories are going to be shared. So that should be coming out later in the year. Okay. Right. So that would be magical. Uh, Co-authoring. So you're yeah. co-authoring with yeah. your guests. Yeah. Oh, awesome. So you're putting the stories from the podcast into yes. the book. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. So it'd be in a physical book, an audio book, and an e-book. Okay. Yeah. And so, is it gonna, like, we'll do, like well, the estimated time of uh, publication? Do we know? Well, we hope for for Christmas period. Uh, everybody's written their five to six thousand words and we're just going through the reviews and then we are doing the, the titles the packaging the branding the marketing and all that coming next so maybe you're coming back on uh you're coming back here to talk about it 
before, yeah you know just before it comes out yeah then that'd be good yes. i mean so it's magical stories and actually writing yeah writing stories and actually sharing we we found over the last year of of doing this collectively uh we've created this bond also with each other and these like 12 people that don't know each other they've just been guests and but also the stories that they're sharing are very very personal and deep and it's kind of a self-help group as well because we've noticed this as we're reviewing each other's and yeah it it's become kind of a an emotional roller coaster ride for for all of us but magical yeah and yeah, yeah. A personal development uh, program wrapped up under the disguise of a of a book public publication. Yeah, it, it really is. I mean, you need more of that. So I've got another book I'm I'm busy writing as well. It's called The Universe Within Your Mind. Oh. And because there is a universe in there, and so much to explore. And it's about going to the different levels of consciousness and also touch on dreams, what dreams mean, the messages within dreams and how to connect also with source and many other things. So, yeah, th that one will be a magical book. Uh, do you have an ETA? Do we have an ETA for this one? No, because I I'm trying to finish off the other one first. Okay. If if money wasn't a problem, I would just write books, write stories, like and listen to stories. I mean, I do my my podcast is is great fun because you meet the most magical people. I mean, really special, beautiful people, and when they share their story quite openly with a complete stranger then there's a trust as well that has to come into that yeah well again i agree with you i certainly agree with you yes such a such a journey to to open up a space for other people to share and then the learning that i got i only have a fraction of the number of guests on my you know on this conversation that you've had and already the the learning uh is fantastic fantastic so it, it is i mean i feel that this is who we are when we can connect and talk like this we don't need the materialistic things and, and the tvs and and all the, the lies and propaganda we just need to reconnect with who we really are and with, with people that 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 want that communication with each other, we we want to feel that we belong, also, and we're not the odd one out. And I, I think it is too easy to to be pushed to one side and seen as the the odd one because you're not conforming to certain things. And but I, I find now it's the other way around. I think they're the odd ones out. And at least I'm doing the things that I want to do and the reasons for doing them. And I don't care if I have no followers. I mean, as long as I believe in myself. Yeah. Yeah. So on these words, James, I'm going to put the name of your show on this video so everyone can go and, and check out these uh, magical, magical uh, connections. Uh, with people and so to everyone thank you for listening and just know that if you feel compelled to share your story you're more than welcome uh, to reach out to James to do that so reach out so James thank you so much for sharing your time with us today I really I really appreciate it I appreciate you and uh, and on these words, I'm going to say goodbye and uh, see you all for another conversation next week. Love you. Thank you, Julie.